As more COVID-19 vaccines are rolling out across the tri-state area, there remain questions and hesitancy in regards to its safety, particularly within the black community. CBS News' Andrea Klein-Thomas sat down with a physician at Weill Cornell Medicine to learn more about the various vaccines and their effectiveness. So what was it about the science specifically? Because you're like, this is monumental. Um, let's first start, start about how fast it was developed. Mm -hmm. Give us perspective on that. Absolutely. So it definitely, you know, feels like, oh my gosh, this is a brand new disease. And all of a sudden, within less than a year, we came up with these vaccines for it. And that's true, but it's also important to recognize that um, particularly for the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, so those are mRNA vac vaccines, and I can touch on that a little bit um, in a second, the data around using mRNA um, at, in a vaccine has been something that's been studied for many, many years. So that concept was not new at all. So really the, the only thing that was new was trying to target the COVID-19 virus as well, uh, COVID, target the COVID-19 virus specifically. That's the part that sort of needed to be done quickly to target this, spe this specific disease, but the technology behind it wasn't something that was new. Let's talk about the mRNA. Um, technology, kind of break that down because the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine both use that. Right. So basically what it is, is that your body needs to know how to fight the vaccine. And so what the mRNA is, is basically like a little piece of the blueprint of how the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID, how that virus infects your cells. So the vaccines take this little tiny piece of the blueprint, it gets injected into your body, some of your cells take up um, that little piece of the blueprint, it's able to see it, and it says, oh, okay, so this is how the COVID virus would infect me, and now it can start to make antibodies, your other cells can make antibodies against the COVID, um, uh, the COVID virus. And so it's a really safe and effective vaccine. Just to give you some perspective, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines got 95% effectiveness, that is unbelievable. The flu vaccine, which we recommend for everyone to get, varies between 40 to 70% effectiveness on a given year. And we still want people to get that because it still stops people from getting severely ill. So we're talking about a vaccine that's above and beyond one of the most common vaccines that we tell people to get all the time. How about when people say, well, I don't want to be a guinea pig. Talk about the vaccine trials and just how many people were involved in it from all walks of life, from all races, ethnicities, et cetera. The first levels of those trials isn't even a, um, sort of determining whether or not they're effective. It's just determining whether or not they're safe. And tens of thousands of volunteers got these vaccines so that we could determine whether there would be any side effects or any type of dangerous things that would happen when you get these vaccines, even before we started studying if they were safe or not. There, is, there couldn't be a guinea pig now because we've already had the people who volunteered to do these trials. And those were really, really amazing people that volunteered to do them because that's absolutely what's necessary for everyone to feel confident that we can now tell the general public that these vaccines are safe. How about side effects? Right, so this is really, really important. And in fact, you know, I actually don't even like to call them side effects. I call them sort of expected reactions because these are the types of things that occur anytime you get a vaccine. And so I'll speak from the eye. So for me, my arm hurt when I got it. I would say it hurt worse than the flu shot did. It was like a pretty intense amount of soreness that I had in my arm for the first few days. And that happened after both my first and my second dose. A lot of my colleagues maybe had things like some people had some chills. A lot of people felt kind of crummy the next day, felt fatigued. Um, maybe some people even spiked a fever. All of those things are re expected reactions. And in fact, there are evidence that the vaccine is working. But there have been a few people who have had, was it anaphylaxis? Is that the term? Right. Like a severe allergic reaction. Absolutely. What's interesting is that the frequency of that happening, even in the trials, was very low and in real life in this country, now that we're giving out seems to be even lower. So we're talking about an event that happens maybe only a few times per million doses. So this is not a common side effect. And you're a breastfeeding mom and you still got the vaccine. So talk about that. Cause that was a big conversation. What happens is that the antibodies that I form against um, the COVID virus can actually be transmitted to my baby through the breast milk. So now, you know, baby Blair can be potentially immune to COVID as well, just because I'm nursing. So in fact, it's the plus, and that's recommended. Um, if you're a lactating woman, you're still recommended 
to get um, to get the vaccine. And I was in the Bronx just the other day um, talking to people about this and they're saying, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. We don't know enough yet. What's your response to that? I would say, you know, I understand, but I would also say, so we have been waiting. We were waiting the whole time that those trials were going on, right? So those trials were the time in which we were waiting to see what happened. And so we've had that time to be able to see what the reactions would be, if there would be anything dangerous about it. And the other thing that I would say is that, you know, I actually agree that can we, can we say that we followed people who have been vaccinated out for four years to see what the potential long-term effects are? No, that's not knowable. We haven't done that. But if the science of it is that most of the time, any reactions or effects that happen would happen within the few, first few weeks to months after getting the vaccine. And we certainly have had that amount of time. So we've been able, the time in which we're most vulnerable to seeing if there's gonna be adverse reactions, we actually have already waited and studied. So in New York City released their uh, numbers of the demographic information of who has gotten the vaccine. And as expected, black and brown communities have not been getting the vaccine. The percentage for uh, Latino um, members, 15% and black folks, 11%, which is not representative of um, the population. Right. So, you know, they always say like medical racism, which we know is a very real thing. Um, Tuskegee, Henrietta Lacks, sterilization, like all of this history. Um, what do you say to your patients if they, you know, come to you and, and talk about that, their concern because of this history? Definitely. So I think all of that needs to be acknowledged and actually can't be trivialized because I think our communities have had to deal with the medical profession with some amount of skepticism that was protective because of the things that were going on in our communities. But then I would also say that this isn't the moment that we're in now. We know that black and brown people are more severely affected by COVID-19. We are the people that need to get it the most because we're the ones who are just having to suffer the worst consequences. So I understand completely the history of all the things that have gone on, but I also bring to this as a person of color, as a scientist and as a doctor, being able to say, this isn't that moment now. And now let's not let those past horrible things make us not do something to protect ourselves now. That would be an even worse outcome than what happened before is to let those things come into the present and then affect our ability to protect our community now. Because I talked to somebody else, I was in Harlem and um, they were saying, well, yes, I've known people who have even died from COVID. I haven't gotten it yet and it's been around for so long, right? So if I can kind of keep having this good luck, then I, I don't need it. Why is that so detrimental, especially with all these other variants popping up? So unfortunately, while I'm happy to hear, for example, that that person has not gotten sick yet, that really doesn't mean anything in terms of if they were to get sick now. And so even more so, it almost would be a shame at this point We've gone this far, we've, and if you've been able to, thank God, not get sick now, to sort of bypass the ability to protect yourself now, it almost seems like more of a shame. So, and I think even more so you bring up the variants, this is like a race that we're in now, right? So the virus is, what its job is, is to find a way to continue to infect people. And the way that it's gonna do that is to get these mutations that's gonna make it sort of a worse virus or a virus that's more contagious. Also in the talk about vaccine hesitancy, um, people are shamed for really being scared and not knowing, and really there's no shame in it. It's just saying, you know, and, and for a lot of communities, we understand, right? There mm -hmm. are very real reasons why the skepticism exists. This is why um, representation matters too, right? So it's one thing if you have someone who's a part of your community who you know, love and trust saying, oh, hey, I've looked at this, this information. I've looked at these data. This is something that is safe and you should get. That means something different than someone who's completely outside of your community who for very real reasons, you have reasons to distrust are telling you you should do this. The thing that I love about science is that it's not subject to any type of opinion, anyone's feelings. The data are the data, and we just need to follow the data, and the data are here for these vaccines. Yeah.